I feel compelled before we begin the actual subject of today's session to say what I'm sure is on everyone's mind. Just a very little while ago, the funerals of the three young boys who were brutally murdered here was completed here in Modi'in. Modi'in, the city that was the focal point of the revolt of the Hasmoneans, just a little bit over 2,100 years ago. And on the one hand, I know our hearts are so broken that it may almost seem pedestrian for us to engage right now in study of the Bible. And you know, indeed, I feel compelled to share with us the words that we read in Psalm 19 in verse 9. The statutes of God are right, upright, rejoicing the heart. Indeed, there really is no greater joy than being able to come together to study God's words. And as a result, one of the central practices of mourning in Jewish tradition is that the mourners are forbidden to study the Torah, forbidden to study God's word, because it's not a time for being happy. Nationally, on the day of national calamity, the ninth of the month of Av, the fast day to which the prophet Zechariah refers, as we've discussed in the past, as the fast of the fifth month. In our morning practices on the ninth of Av, likewise, we don't study the Torah. Only those parts like the Book of Lamentations that are keenly appropriate to the spirit of the day. And yet, Simultaneously for us, so badly in need of consolation, in the world, I think there's nothing more appropriate for us to be doing than to do our utmost to connect with God's words that offer us at such moments not only solace, but guidance to weather the storms that we face. On the one hand, we read repeatedly in the Torah, in the prophets, that God is compassionate and free-giving. It's important for us to also recall the words of the prophet Nahum, the very beginning of his relatively short book in the Bible. The second verse, God is a zealous and revenging God. God revenges and is full of wrath. God takes vengeance upon his adversaries and he keeps wrath for his enemies. Now, we should appreciate it doesn't contradict God being our compassionate Father, but it is a critical additional dimension that we always need to recall. As expressed in Psalm 9, in verse 13, 
For God avenges blood. He remembers it. He does not forget the cry of the humble. If I may share with you briefly an insight of one of the commentators in this verse in Psalm 9. He remembers the blood, the shedders of the blood that he avenges. And for such people who have sold themselves to evil, to all the forces of wickedness, that is the only thing that he remembers. As opposed to the second part of the verse, he does not forget the cry of the humble. He does not forget the cry of the humble at all. Because indeed, he promises, as we read in the prophecy of Yoel, the end of Yoel, the very last verse, though I have cleansed them, there is much that God cleanses. There is much with respect that God may forbear. But those who shed their blood, I shall not cleanse. Their blood will be avenged. And God will dwell here in Zion. The words of the prophet Yoel. And to conclude this note, to indeed keenly sense how God's mercy is necessarily related to this vengeance. In Isaiah chapter 61, at the beginning of the chapter, the prophet gives us his mission. The Spirit of God the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to announce good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim a year of favor of God and a day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. May our studying God's word together today again provide not only solace but guidance in such a smitten, stricken world. And furthermore, may our coming together in our virtual world, studying the Bible from Zion, be a harbinger of those final words of Yoel. I will never cleanse the blood, and God dwells in Zion. Amen. On that note, on that sobering note, we continue with our central agenda for today, which is the rise and fall of Bil'am, and the lessons that we learn from that rise and fall. And as I think we'll have an opportunity to see, the message of this study is particularly apropos, particularly relevant today, specifically, perhaps, today.
with that, without any further ado, we turn to Numbers chapter 22. Of course, Numbers chapter 22 follows immediately on the heels of Israel's battles with Sichon and Og, the kings of the Emory, and the astounding victories that God granted. And afterward, the people of Israel journeyed and encamped in the plains of Moab. And Balak, the son of Tifor, the king of Moab, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified, overcome with dread. And so Balak has a plan. Moab said to the elders of Midian, this multitude will lick up all that is around us as the ox licks up the grass of the field, and Balak then sends messengers to that resident of Midian, Bil'am, to Petar, which is by the river, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Go now, therefore, I pray you, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is accursed. And so the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian come to Bilam. Now, the challenge, inevitably, and what follows, is to consider what we have to say based upon the reactions of Bilam. In Verse 8, after Bilam has heard this solicitation, he says to the messengers, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you back word, as God may speak to me. I can't do this on my own. I need to receive God's license. And in verse 9, God came to Bilam. And when Bilam explains the circumstances of his soliciting God's permission. God says in verse 12, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. And note, Bilam is faithfully obedient. In verse 13, he says to the messengers, get you into your land, for God refuses to give me leave to go with you. I'm following divine orders. And so they report back to Balak, who is obviously dissatisfied with this turn of events. And he sends new messengers, more in number and more honorable than the first. And they came to Bilam and said to him in verse 16, Thus says Balak, the son of Tipar, let nothing, I pray you, hinder you from going to me, for I will promote you to very great honor, and whatsoever you say to me, I will do. Go, therefore, I pray, curse me this people. So, of course, the seduction is considerable here. And yet, Ilam remains steadfast, so it appears in his complete faithfulness to God. In verse 18, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of God, my Lord, to do anything small or great. But, wait around a little bit and let's see if we get any further instructions. Exactly what Bilam is attempting to achieve by this is admittedly a tantalizing question, but in verse 19, he tells them, tarry you here this night, that I may know what God will speak unto me more. And sure enough, in verse 20, God comes to Bilam, and he says to him, if the men are come to call you, rise up, go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that shall you do. 
So Bilam goes, and ostensibly, he's going in complete, undiminished, unlimited faithfulness to God. There is indeed an additional episode here in the chapter that, because of the limitations of time, we omit this time around. But continuing the narrative with verse 36, when Balak heard that Bil'am was come, he went out to meet him in Ir Moab, which is on the border of Arnon, which is in the utmost part of the border. And Balak says to Bil'am, what took you so long? Did I not earnestly send unto you to call you? Wherefore went you not to me? Why didn't you come sooner? Am I not able to promote you to honor? And Bilam makes it clear. I am come to you. Have I now any power at all to speak anything? I can't do this on my own. The word that God puts in my mouth, that shall I speak. That alone shall I speak. And what then unfolds is precisely how this plays itself out in the narrative of the encounter between Balak and Bil'am. After they go to the first station and Balak sets up his altars, Bil'am says, to him, this is in chapter 33, verse 3, Stand by your burnt offering, and I will go. Perhaps God will, to translate literally here, chance upon me. And whatever he shows me, I will tell you. And he went alone. And an interesting expression, God chances upon him, but indeed, Scripture says that that's what happened. That is, in the Hebrew, Bil'am uses yikare, which means to happen, to chance upon, and in the following verse, the same root in a different kind of conjugation, but with the same meaning, vayikar. God happened upon, chanced upon Bil'am, and then we read in verse 5 that God put a word in Bilam's mouth and said, Return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And he returns, and this is what he has to say. While you, Balak, summoned me, go curse me, Jacob, and go execrate Israel, verse 8, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I execrate whom God has not execrated? Verse 9, for from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, it is a people that shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Verse 10, who has counted the dust of Jacob, or numbered the stock of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my end be like his. So, of course, Balak is none too pleased with this turn of events. Balak says, what have you done to me? I took you to curse my enemies, and behold, you blessed them altogether. And Bil'am sticks to his guns. He answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which God puts in my mouth? I have to obey. And the narrative continues. We're bridging because of the limitations of time, but... Then they go to another location, and the same scene repeats itself. And again, God, note, happens upon, chances upon, Bil'am, that same extraordinary expression, and puts a word in his mouth and says, return to Balak, and thus you shall speak. And Bil'am returns to Balak, and beginning in verse 19, he gives Balak his message. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. But he said, will he not do it? And when he has spoken, will he not make it good? Verse 20, behold, I am bidden to bless. And when he has blessed, I cannot call it back. He beheld no iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. God his Lord is with him, 
and shouting out for friendship of the king is among them. Verse 22, God who brought them forth out of Egypt is for them like the lofty horns of the wild ox. Verse 23, for there is no enchantment or divination in Jacob, neither is there any soothsaying in Israel. Now it is said of Jacob and Israel, what has God wrought? Verse 24, Behold, the people that rises up as a lioness, and as a lion does lift himself up, he shall not lie down until he eats of the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Victory. Blessing. And, of course, at this point, Balak is getting desperate. In verse 25, neither curse them at all nor bless them at all. And Elam's ready response, again, with complete consistency. Didn't I tell you? All that God speaks, that I must do. So these are the first two encounters. On to Numbers chapter 24. And Numbers chapter 24, we read from the beginning of the chapter that when Bil'am saw that it pleased God to bless Israel, he went not as at the other times to meet with omens, divinations, enchantments, but set his face toward the wilderness. And when Bil'am sees Israel dwelling tribe by tribe, the Spirit of God comes upon him. And his message Your dwellings, O Israel. I feel compelled to stress here that these unforgettable words are in our prayer books as the words that we say upon entry into the synagogue every morning. How good be on your tent, so Jacob, your dwelling, so Israel. We got the line from Bilam. And he continues in verse 6, As streams stretched out, as gardens by the riverside, as aloes planted of God, as cedars beside the waters, verse 7, water shall flow from his buckets, wells, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king will be exalted higher than Agag, and his kingdom exalted. Verse 8, God who brought him forth out of Egypt is for him like the lofty horns of the wild ox. He shall eat up the nations that are his adversaries, and shall break their bones in pieces and pierce them through his arrow. Which, of course, obviously, includes Moab that has made itself into the adversary of Israel. And indeed, the continuation, he couched, he lay down as a lion, and as a lioness, who shall rouse him up? Blessed be everyone who blesses you, and cursed be everyone who curses you. Well, this is clearly over the top. That is, not only has Bilam refrained from cursing, not only has he further not fulfilled Balak's desperate hope that Bilam would neither bless nor curse, but in fact, he has cursed anyone who curses Israel. So, at this point, Balak, of course, is beside himself. In verse 10, Balak's anger was kindled against Bilam, and he smote his hands together, and he says to Bilam, I called you to curse my enemies. Behold, you have altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore, now flee from, your, from here to your place. I thought to promote you the great honor, but, well, God has kept you back from honor. One can almost hear the sarcasm dripping in his venomous words. And Bilam remains faithful to the end. Bilam said to Balak, didn't I also speak to your messengers, saying, in verse 13, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot transgress the word of God to do either good or bad of my own mind. When God speaks, that will I speak. Now, let's pause for a moment. It's always good for us to consider the relevance of what is taking place here in our own lives. Imagine ourselves faced with this challenge. On the one hand, you are being promoted to the greatest honors imaginable by one of the most powerful kings of the time. Fame, fortune, Wealth, everything. Just say the curse and violate God's word. Or 
remain faithful to God's command and earn for yourself disgrace, disparagement, maybe even personal danger. After all, this is a powerful king, and kings in those days were autocratic and exerted complete authority over life and death. It certainly is a challenge with which to reckon. But we see Bil'an reckoning with this challenge with flying colors. He remains faithful through to the end and refuses to compromise at all on what God commands him to do. There is yet a fourth prophecy. We should consider that as well. That is, in verse 14, how I go unto my people. Which perhaps also carries a connotation of I am descending back to the level of the people. But in any case, before that, I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the end of days. And continuing in chapter 24, Bil'am gives Balak and us the final prophecy. The content of which begins in verse 17, I see him but not now, I behold him but not nigh. There shall step forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall crush the princes of Moab and dominate all the sons of Seth and Edom likewise shall be destroyed Seir also even his enemies shall be destroyed while Israel does valiantly and out of Jacob shall one have dominion and shall destroy the remnant from the city and There continues a progression, a litany of additional verses describing the destruction visited upon the wicked in the future to come. That in the end, who can survive God's devastation? All of the enemies shall be destroyed forever. And finally, Bilam is finished. He rose up and went and returned to his place. Now, I feel compelled to add an additional dimension and to consider this additional dimension because from what we've seen thus far, not only is it not supported by the text, it seems to go directly against what we've seen in the text. Bil'am, seems to be presented as a faithful servant of God who is uncompromising, unswerving in his obedience to God's commands. And yet, in our tradition, Ilan is an exponent of evil, a champion of wickedness, archetypal for human corruption and faithlessness. Of course, inevitably, we need to ask ourselves, how could that be? Again, I reiterate, just consider us faced with his challenge. Could we have done better? than he did, he seems to have passed the tests with sterling colors. And I think there are a number of dimensions that need to be considered here. A number of dimensions, some of which are intimated here in the text, some of which are not, but that are all inevitably rooted in the Bible and become lessons all the more critical, all the more important, precisely because Bil'am comes across, at first brush at least, as such a positive character. And so I'd like to consider a number of dimensions, at least 
four in reflecting upon who Bil'am is and what his rise and fall teach us. We'll start with the most straightforward. Now, the most straightforward ostensibly has absolutely nothing to do with Bil'am's character. That is, immediately after what we just saw, which is the conclusion of chapter 24, of course, comes chapter 25. And chapter 25 describes disaster. Ironically, following the rousing words of blessing of Bil'am, in verse 1, Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. Harlotry, sexual immorality, and idolatry to boot. Verse 3, and Israel joined himself unto the Baal of Peor a pagan abomination, the service of which was so disgusting that Scripture doesn't even provide us much in the way of detail. And of course, inevitably, the anger of God was kindled against Israel. And what follows is a devastating plague. And we read in verse 9, and those that died by the plague 24,000. Now again, of course, I'm going to reiterate. There isn't anything in any obvious manner that links what we just saw in Numbers chapter 25 to Bil'am. And yet, not in the initial narrative of Bil'am, rather as a kind of retrospective. In Numbers chapter 31, verse 16, Moses comments on the daughters of Moab slash Midian, saying, Behold, these caused the people of Israel through the counsel of Bil'am to revolt, so as to break faith with God in the matter of the Or. And so the plague was among the congregation of God. We didn't see this at first brush. It was so subtle, evidently, it wasn't even recorded. But why indeed did the catastrophe of Numbers 25 follow immediately on the heels of Bil'am's visit? Moses tells us it was Bil'am's idea. And, of course, as fully befitting the author of this idea, what we read earlier on in Numbers chapter 31, when Moses says to the people in verse 3, Arm you men from among you for the war, that they will go against Midian to execute God's vengeance on Midian, God having pronounced this mandate in the previous verses. We read in verse 8 that the people in executing God's vengeance, also slew Bil'am, the son of Be'or, with the sword. He gets his just desserts. Ironic, in a way, isn't it? When one considers that in Bil'am's extolling Israel in the first of his blessings, he prays that me by the death of the righteous and let my end be like his but his end was not like his because of course to die the death of the righteous you have to live the life of the righteous and again Ilam is the one who gives the counsel let's figure out some way to get them So this, of course, on the most obvious plane, gives us, at the very least, a crime. But 
you know, when you consider what this answer tells us, I suspect it raises more questions than it settles. Because, once again, how could this be the way Bil'am acts when he demonstrates such unswerving fidelity and obedience to God? What happened? So answer number one is a start. It gives us the, a crime, but it doesn't really give us a resolution. And so we continue with answer number two. Bil'am's execution, because it certainly was that, at the hand of Israel, is mentioned res- retrospectively in Joshua chapter 13. But it is mentioned here with a crucial additional dimension. One word that did not appear in the descriptions of Bil'am in the five books of Moses. Bil'am, the son of Be'or, the soothsayer. Did the people of Israel slay with a sword among the rest of their slain? In Hebrew, hakosem. What does soothsaying mean? Or, more importantly, what does it tell us about the person? Well, the first thing inevitably, is considering what we know about soothsayers in Deuteronomy chapter 18, when Moses warns us, beginning in verse 9, when you come into the land that God your Lord gives you, you shall not learn to do like the abominations of those nations that are there. Verse 10, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. That was the Moloch rite. Or a soothsayer, a diviner of auspicious times, a diviner of omens, or a sorcerer. In the Hebrew, the same ksamim, soothsayer. The same crime in which Bil'am is implicated. Verse 12. For whoever does these things is an abomination unto God. And because of these abominations, God your Lord is driving them out from before you. Rather, in contrast, verse 13, you shall be wholehearted with God your Lord. It's important for us to understand what soothsaying and all of these other forms of divination mean in contrast with being wholesome with God your Lord. Wholesome means you're in charge, God. I know you know what you're doing, even if I don't understand at all. An important message for us to bear in mind, certainly, on a day like today, when we recognize we don't have a clue what God's plan is. We know the final chapter. We don't know what else takes place on the way there. But we know, we trust that he knows. And what of the soothsayer? Bilam is described as a soothsayer. And we might note further in this vein that in the initial mission, when Balak sends his first messengers to Bilam, he sends them with rewards of divination, magic charms. In the Hebrew, it's the same root, ksamim. This was something that was very central to the pagan mentality, where divination, sorcery, soothsaying, cursing, blessing, all of it was means to procure the goods from God illicitly. 
let's find the appropriate shortcut, the appropriate incantation, the mechanism through which to be able to cut corners, get in through the back door and obtain what we want to get. Bil'am was a champion soothsayer. Bil'am signifies attempting, even in the context of complete, unswerving obedience to God, to get the goods through the back door. And indeed, in this vein, we should consider further what we read in the words of the prophets regarding soothsayers in Isaiah chapter 44, beginning in verse 24. Thus says God, your Redeemer, he that formed you from the womb, I am God who makes all things, who stretched forth the heavens alone, who spread abroad the earth by myself, who frustrates the tokens of impostors, and make soothsayers mad. It turns wise men backward and makes their knowledge foolish. What's the point here? The point here is that the prognosticators are not going to know the truth. The prognosticators will never know the plan. Because so long as one is trying to manipulate the plan, one will never access. God's will. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. <clears throat> that plan will indeed be the plan as God saying to Jerusalem, she shall be inhabited and of the cities of Judah they shall be built and I will raise up the waste places they will. But as for the soothsayers, they will understand nothing. They will go mad in their inability to understand. And this crime, I'm embarrassed to admit, is one that the prophet Zechariah also attributes to Israel, specifically the leadership. In Zechariah chapter 10, verse 2, the Teraphim has spoken vanity and the soothsayers have seen a lie. And the dreams speak falsely, they comfort in vain. Therefore, because the leaders are engaging in all this illicit behavior, the people go their way like sheep. They are afflicted because there is no shepherd. My anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the he-goats. Ultimately, though, in the continuation of verse 3, For the God of hosts has remembered his flock, the house of Judah, and makes them as his majestic horse in the battle. By being wholesome with God, the horse doesn't make its own decisions. But the horse is faithful, truly faithful, to what the master guides it to do. You shall be wholesome with God your Lord. You um, obey. But he obeyed because he had to. He obeyed because he wasn't a fool. He recognizes that God is in charge but he'll do everything he can while conceding that God is completely in charge to get his way. So this, of course, at least provides us with some initial insight into understanding how it could be that Bilam, who in unswerving obedience to God can say such rousing, exalted words of blessing and still, immediately afterward, give the counsel to Balak. You know, I can give you some good ideas that you can apply. You have some daughters. Maybe we can do something to destroy this nation. 
boggles the mind. But when you have the mentality of a soothsayer, I guess it's not so far-fetched. This is our second level of understanding. Again, appreciating that indeed, as Joshua tells us, Ilan is a soothsayer, not a faithful prophet of God. But there's an additional dimension, and this additional dimension necessarily brings us back to the narrative in Numbers chapter 22, starts out with this expression that God came to Bil'am, which is exceptional enough as it is, but is all the more exceptional when one considers the even stranger expression. We already noted this in Numbers chapter 23. Perhaps God will happen upon me, chance upon me, says Bilam in verse 3. And indeed, in verse 4, God happens upon Bilam. And similarly, in verse 16, God happens, chances upon Bilam. What in the world does that mean? Happening? Chancing? Obviously not that God is out for some stroll and meets him coincidentally. So what does chance mean here? And inevitably, this forces us to consider the subtle but crucial difference between two words in Hebrew that look almost alike, but that derive from different roots and mean things that are completely different, maybe even opposite. The term used in describing God's chanting upon Bil'am is Vayikar. And indeed, Vayikar comes from the root Karo, which means happening, and can refer to chance. And then there's another word. And this other word is especially germane by way of contrast, and that is Vayikra. Vaikra is the call. So, of course, an exhaustive discussion of Vaikra in Scripture would be far beyond the time that we have available, but some examples, I think, will help to serve as apt illustrations. In Exodus chapter 3, Moses first sees the burning bush. And in verse 3 of chapter 3, Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. In other words, Moses is directing himself, preparing to understand what it is that he is seeing, cognizant that he sees, as expressed in verse 2, the angel of God appearing to him in the flame. And in verse 4, when God saw that he turned aside to see, that is, when God saw that he had prepared himself, God called to him out of the midst of the bush. And similarly, in Exodus chapter 24, after the theophany at Mount Sinai, Moses went up into the mount, we read in verse 15, and the cloud covered the mount, and the glory of God abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. So Moses is already there six full days before. On the seventh day, God called unto Moses, Vayikra, out of the midst of the cloud. Again, Vayikra. Not Vayikra. Similarly, at the very end of Exodus, in chapter 40, we read about the prodigious efforts put into completing the tabernacle. In verse 33, he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar. This is at the end of the detailed description of putting together the tabernacle. He set up the screen of the gate of the court, and Moses finished the work. Verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. It filled the tabernacle so that Moses was unable to enter it, because the cloud filled it. And the glory of God filled the tabernacle. 
just as in Exodus chapter 24, the glory of God on Mount Sinai prevented Moses initially from, as it were, coming in until God calls him. And just as here too, the opening word of Leviticus is Vayikra, when God called to Moses and spoke unto him out of the tent of meeting, the call that follows all that preparation. That's an expression that doesn't only apply in the relationship between God and man. In Isaiah chapter 6, which we discussed very recently, we see it with respect to the angels. In chapter 6, verse 2, above God stand the seraphim, the angels. And in verse 3, one called unto another. Again, the call. It's a call that comes before saying, before the word. First, there is the call, a reflection of the preparation. And so we encounter it in additional passages of Isaiah directed by God and all Israel. You whom I have taken hold of from the end of the earth and called you, I call you from the uttermost parts of the nobles and said to you, you are my servant. The call before the saying. Similarly, in Isaiah chapter 48, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call, my call is a description The pinnacle of God's statement is, you are called. Verse 15, I even I have spoken, yea, I have called him. I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Now, this is calling. This is vaikra. This is not vaikar. What is vaikar? A good place to get the definition is, when we read about the attack of Amalek in Deuteronomy chapter 25 in retrospect, where the attack of Amalek, of which we read initially in Exodus chapter 17, is described as in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 18, how he happened upon you, chanced upon you, by the way. Again, karecha vaikar, chancing happening. It's interesting to note that God tells Moses to introduce his mission to Pharaoh by saying, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, happened upon, chanced upon us. Because evidently Pharaoh wouldn't be able to understand any other kind of encounter with God. What essentially is Bilam saying when he speaks of God happening upon me, chancing upon me, and when the Bible reports That's what God did. Obviously, it wasn't chance for God, but it was chance for Gil'an. To earn the call of Vayikra requires preparation. A chance encounter? Well, by definition, you don't plan a chance encounter. Gil'an's connection with God is what's described as chance. That is, Bil'am doesn't ready himself. Readying oneself for an encounter with God implies the arduous effort of growing, developing spiritually, climbing step by step in order to make oneself worthy of the encounter with God. Bil'am does nothing of the sort. What he does is he aims for chance encounters. Maybe an apt analogy would be if you work yourself up into an ecstasy, a religious frenzy, that you can soar. And if you soar high enough, you may encounter God. You may chance upon God. But if 
instead of climbing step by step, you soar this way. Once you finish soaring, you start diving, plummeting. And again, we recall, Ilam gives us these exalted blessings, prophetic expressions. And afterward, let's see if we can destroy Israel by making them sin. All we have to do is put our daughters of the hollow tree. The diseased mind of someone who can be faithful, obedient, and rotten to the core within himself. That's our third dimension. Again, the realization that Bil'an is obedient. He knows what the consequences of disobedience are. That's very good, but the inner corruption remains solidly inside. Never redeemed. Never rehabilitated. And this brings us to the fourth and admittedly most subtle dimension. And this is something that is not stated in narrative in numbers at all. It is rather a subtle nuance of which we read in retrospect with respect to Bil'am in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 5, where we read that Moab and Ammon hired against you Bil'am, the son of Be'or, from the Tor of, there's a place here, Aram Naharayim, to curse you. Aram Naharayim is a place designation. Tantalizingly, it is an exceedingly rare place designation in the Bible. Prior to King David's battle against Aram, we encounter Aram Naharaim as a place designation in precisely three instances, three passages in the Bible. This is all the more tantalizing, considering that I believe Aram Naharaim is all but unknown in the archaeological record as a place designation at all, which implies it may not be simply geography. It may be a label. What does Aram Naharaim mean? Well, literally, it means Aram of the doubling of the river. The double river. The double river, of course, geographically, because Aram is where the Tigris and Euphrates converge. So, simply enough, we understand doubling in that sense, but not only in that sense. Let's consider the other two passages in which we encounter that label, Aram Naharaim. One, is in Judges chapter 3, the first adversary of Israel in the book of Judges. is someone by the name of Kushan Rishatayim, king of Aram Naharai. Rishatayim, the Aim suffix, has the same meaning as it is in Naharaim, means doubly wicked. Kushan, the doubly wicked, King of Aram of the Double Rivers. And indeed, he is described in rather um, grotesque terms of wickedness, considering the sort of thing that he did. We won't go into the details, but in considering the role of Kushan, doubly wicked, as the first adversary of Israel coming against them after Joshua. And Bil'am, coming against them from Aram Naharaim, first them, on their way into the land of Israel. And one additional instance, 
and this additional instance is perhaps the most subtle and complex. In Genesis chapter 24, we read that when Abraham charged his servant to find a wife for Isaac, the servant took 10 camels, in verse 10, of the camels of his master and departed, having all goodly things of his master in his hand. And he rose and went to Aram Naharaim, Aram of the double rivers, the city of Nahar. Now it's interesting to note that Abraham's servant in verses 12 through 14 seems to do a bit of divination of his own in that he says, O God, the Lord of my master Abraham, send me, I pray you, good speed, or perhaps more precisely, we should say, using again the same root as Vayikav, please cause to happen to me this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. I'm looking for the right woman, and so let the damsel to whom I say, Give me to drink from your pitcher, and says, Drink, and I will also give your camel drink. Be the one whom you have appointed for my servant Isaac. And indeed, what follows is, of course, immediately the encounter with Rebecca and the manner in which, with such dedication to kindness, she not only offers drink to Abraham's servant, but also draws water for all of his camels. But there's an additional dimension in the story, an additional personality who plays a central role, and that is, in verse 29, we read, And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man unto the fountain, and when he saw the ring and the bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, saying, Thus spoke the man unto me, then he came to the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the mountain. And he said, Come in, you blessed of God. Why are you standing outside? For I have cleared the house and made room for the camels. And once again, Laban comes across as a true gentleman, a paragon of kindness, just like his sister at least on the surface, except that the Bible has already told us in verse 30, he only did it because he saw the ring and the bracelets of his sister's ass. He saw an opportunity here. Manipulate the servant, just like Bilam tries to manipulate God. Obedient, gentlemen. And Madan, of course, Later on, when we encounter him once again, when Jacob comes to his household, is the exemplar, the archetypal man of deceit and trickery. Aram Naharayim, double river, doubling, like Kushan, doubly wicked. Doubling because you can always see things one way or the other way. It is, of course, a well-known expression in English to speak out of both sides of one's mouth, which implies someone who has no inner integrity at all. He says one thing one way, another thing the other way. Aram of the double river. Aram invoked with these three personalities specifically. Perhaps, in order to hint at duplicity. Now, it's important when we speak of duplicity here to recognize we aren't speaking of people who fit the simple description of the criminal. Again, Lavan is all gentleman. Bilam is all faithfulness to God. We could extend this point further and note, Rebecca comes from Aram Naharaim herself. But Rebecca takes the challenge and uses it to dedicate herself truly, sincerely to kindness and serving God. And for these others, it's just another opportunity along the way.
the doubling, perhaps more than anything else, carries the connotation for us of what life is all about. And it's on this note that I'd like to conclude in considering what the final abiding lesson that we should be learning from Bil'am, indeed, is. A recurrent theme that we encounter over and over again, in particular, in the retrospective references to Bil'am, is that God would not hearken to Bil'am, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 6, but God turned the curse into a blessing. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 10, similarly, I would not hearken unto Bilam, therefore he even blessed you, so I delivered you out of his hand. And in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 2, the Moabites hired Bilam against Israel to curse them, but our God turned the curse into a blessing. There's an inevitable question here, is there not? Why does God have to turn Bil'am's curse into a blessing? Could he just ignore it? Or force Bil'am to stay home? Or have him speak the words that God wanted him to speak, irrespective of whether he was going to obey or not? And perhaps it is an answer to this question that the formulation similarly, but subtly differently, in the words of Micah chapter 6, verse 5, are, remember what Bil'am, the son of Be'or, answered, Balak, from Shittim unto Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of God. What righteous acts of God? Perhaps most fundamentally, and maybe Aram of the double rivers drives this point home strongest. Life is all about choices. God is not going to annul evil because God gives us the choice. Indeed, God creates the opportunity for evil. In Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am God who does all these things. In Amos chapter 3, verse 6, shall evil be full of city and God has not done it? In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 38, out of the mouth, mouth of the Most High proceed not both evil and good. Everything comes from God. It's important for us to stress, and we've noted this in the past, that when in the book of Job, in chapter 1, verse 6, and chapter 2, verse 1, we read of the Satan, usually given the same name in English as well, Satan. He's not in business for himself. He's not an autonomous creature. On the contrary, when all of the angels of God come to present themselves before God, Satan comes also among them because he's just another servant. God creates him as he creates them all, and they are all beholden to God. His role is to ensure that we have the choice. And then the question is, what will we do with it? Because it's expressed in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, God made man upright, including Bilam, including all of us, including the brutal monsters who murdered those innocent children. But they sought out many intrigues, many contrivances. They were upright. They had the choice. They always had the choice. And they chose. And as God expresses it in Deuteronomy chapter 11 through Moses, in verse 26, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. It's up to you. And likewise, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Verse 15, see, I have said before you this day, life and good and death 
and the evil. It's up to you. In verse 19, I call the heaven and earth to witness against you this day that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life that you may live, you and your seed. It's up to you. Bilam had a rise. They had fall. Because faced with the choice of the blessing and the curse, even when he was blessing, he chose the curse. Deep within him, he was not allied with God's will, but with his own will. He obeyed when he needed to obey. He remained Ilam the wicked through and through. May we have the insight, the foresight, the dedication, the perseverance, because we all face the challenges and we all have the choices. To follow God's bidding in realizing that he has placed before us life and death, the blessing and the curse, to choose life, to choose the blessing, to truly integrate into our lives God's will, not because we need to, but because we truly are faithful. Because that's the only source of blessing. And life is all about choices. The greatest gift is to be able to choose. We can learn the consequences for better and for worse. From all those whom we see who have chosen. Ilan chose one way. Brutal murderers of innocent, defenseless children also chose one way. May we dedicate ourselves to choose the better. And thus, do we merit God's everlasting blessings? God bless you.